Hey folks, this episode of Watch and Listen is brought to you by our title sponsor, Crown and Caliber. Crown and Caliber is an online and in-person watch buyer, seller, fixer, broker, helper, enthusiast, content creator. They're well, they're everything. They're good people down there at Crown and Caliber. <laughs> they have over 2,000 watches in stock at any given time from over 40 different brands. All the big ones, Rolex, Omega, Panerai, Cartier, all the heavy hitters uh, in the watch world. And uh, whether it's newer, older, vintage, mid-range, uh, late model, or current generation, odds are they have it. If they don't have it, they could find it. And if they don't have it and they can't find it, it and you have it, boy, do they want to buy it off of you. They don't just buy, uh, sell watches. They buy watches at Crown & Caliber. So if you've got a watch uh, laying around, sitting in a drawer, uh, maybe it's $1,000, maybe it's $20,000, maybe it was an heirloom and you want to cash out, maybe you want to upgrade to something that's a little more you today, call Crown & Caliber. It's not shady. It's not happening in a parking lot or on a forum. Uh, this is legit stuff here. This is what they do full-time, all the time. They have a full staff of people down there in Atlanta that just do this. We are so happy to have them. They've uh, not only provided us with the funding to do this show, but also uh, they send us a bunch of really cool watches to feature on the show. So a lot of the watches that you will see uh, and hear about on Watch and Listen are available from Crown and Caliber. So if that interests you, check them out. Uh, Watch and Listen is also brought to you by Beeline Coffee. Talking all fast because I'm drinking Beeline Coffee. I have been drinking this stuff for like a year about, and uh, since they just started, their roasts are really good. Uh, these are some car and watch enthusiasts, uh, and they are also true coffee aficionados. Um, this isn't uh, your Folgers or even your Starbucks or even some mid-level, like Whole Foods level beans. This is single origin High altitude, you know, it's Central America, it's Africa. The uh, these are where the best beans come from, and now they have a smoking tire roast. It's my personal roast. It's light. It's got a medium body. It's delicious at any time of the day, uh, morning, noon, or even night. Well, you probably you probably don't want to drink it like at night unless you really want to be up. It will. It's got got some caffeine in it. It's good. Um, and if you use code TST at BeelineCoffee.com, I will give you 15% off for supporting the people who support the Watch and Listen podcast. All right, then. On with the show. Uh, in this episode, Cameron Weiss of the Weiss Watch Company and I are going to go through the entire history of the mechanical watch from the sun uh, and to almost the smart watch, to a smart-ish Mechanical watch. We don't want to talk about smart watches because we don't like smart watches on Watch and Listen. We like we like watches that are machines on Watch and Listen. And so that's the direction we're taking this show. But here's an in-depth uh, dive into the history of the wristwatch on the Watch and Listen podcast. Probably adults. What's up, adults? Welcome to Watch and Listen, the podcast about watches. Brought to you by those folks who brought you the smoking tire. I'm Matt Farah. I'm the loud one. And I'm Cameron Weiss. <laughs> I'm, I'm quieter. <laughs> and he's the smart one. What's happening? Welcome. Uh, thank you to our sponsor, Crown and Caliber, for making this entire show possible. We are happy to have you. First off, housekeeping. Follow us on Instagram, uh, the smoking tire on Instagram for me. And of course, Weiss Watch Company, for the Cameron, and Cameron M. Weiss as well. What yeah. would you prefer, Weiss Watch Company? Uh, both. Follow me in both places. For those of you who don't know, I come from the car world. I make videos about cars. Cameron makes watches from scratch, like this one that I'm pulling up on the screen. We're on video. We're on audio. Follow us on YouTube. Watch and listen podcast. Follow us on audio. Shoutengine.com slash watch and listen podcast. I think. We'll have links for you. <laughs> anyway, uh, good to have you back. Here we are. Today, we are going to talk about the history of watchmaking from the beginning to, well, today, I think. 
We're going to try. Yeah. There's a, it's a big world, right? It's a yeah. long history. It's a big world. We're talking about a couple of thousand years. Yeah, and it although... starts off pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, it, and uh, yeah, they didn't figure stuff out for a while. But yeah. uh, So let's go way back. How far back are we going to go? We're going to go to the beginning? Yeah, the sun. The sun and the sun dial. Yep, the uh, sundial, and I, I think even before the sundial, just the, the sun. uh, <laughs> just the sun, uh, yeah. Naman, Naman, yeah, a stick. What's that? Anything that casts a shadow, basically. So before there was an actual dial, such as this, yeah, uh, this. I think this is an early Spanish dial we've got here. It was just a stick in the ground. Yeah, a okay. stick, a tree, fence post, anything. But it doesn't. The sun does. Can you read a sundial? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, could you read? Okay, you can read a sundial. Can you read a stick in the ground? I can read a stick in the ground <laughs> to a certain extent. It's not the most accurate uh, way to get time, and it's not going to be the same as other people's stick in the ground. <laughs> but uh, you need to. The problem with the stick in the ground method, I think, is you need to watch the stick for like quite some time. Yeah, you can't just uh, you know it doesn't work like if you need to know right now. Yeah, and it, it doesn't work at night either. Good point. <laughs> Good point. Uh, so we go with the sundial. Sundial is basically uh, a stick plus markings. Yeah. It's a stick that's more permanent. And yeah. we've established what these uh, the markings are. All right. Is that, is that it? That's all we really... I mean, how much do you spend on sundials? <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much it, I think, for, uh, okay. for well, the old school sun So stuff. that's a sundial. Uh, while the sundial goes back to like we're talking Egypt, right, fifteen hundred BC Egypt, um, you know when my people were carrying rocks up hills, <laughs> that's a Jew thing. Okay, uh, so there was that. But then in Persia, check this out. So here's I don't here's a here's a, this is a, a Persian water clock. So <clears throat> for those on the audio portion of this, what we're looking at it looks like a big ceramic pot with water in it, and then floating in that. In that ceramic pot is a bowl, and the bowl has a little bit of a little bit of a hole in the bottom of the bowl, uh, and then there's there's then a few indentations as you go up the side of the bowl towards the lip of the bowl, and the bowl sits in the water, uh, and the uh, the water the hole slowly lets in a certain amount of water over time, and then like a measuring cup, as the bowl sinks deeper and deeper into the water, you know how much time has passed by. This is more of like a uh, stopwatch i think or like an hourglass kind of thing than a proper clock right yeah i mean it's all relative really um if if you made two of these with the same size hole or a similar hole and you and your good friend who always get dinner at the same time have uh, the same bowl i cannot ki- i cannot <laughs> cook in hamush's kitchen his his water clock all my timing is all the way off. I don't know. Hamush's clock is shit. Yeah. I have a much better clock than him. I have a Rolex water clock. <laughs> So that was, so these clocks, right? This clock required a, a like a clocker, like a person who cuz this bowl we're talking like 15 minutes for this bowl to fill up with water. So this person re, this required a dude to sit there and when the bowl filled up, he would dump the water into this other pot and then he would start over. And this was all day. Yeah. <laughs> all day this guy would sit here. What a boring gig. Watch yeah. bowl, I guess I guess it's better than probably some of the other gigs that were available in Persia at this time. Yes, but <laughs> I would imagine this is probably like a lug. This is like a lug. This is like a, a two no shows and two no works. You know, the <laughs> town clocker is like the union guy that doesn't give a fuck. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I actually, there's a really you know, you got to kind of respect the ingenuity of of you know recognizing that water flows in this thing in a consi- in a consistent pace like yeah it's the this clock it demonstrates like the recognizing of um constants right exactly that, that this water will flow through this hole in a constant yeah it's pretty neat actually. and that they could make multiple water clocks that uh that work together and yeah you could probably make like with multiple bowls and pots you yeah. could have like an hour hand and a minute hand pretty much like hour bowl minute bowl yeah yeah, like smaller you, holes, bigger holes. Yeah, that yep. would actually be interesting. You think they would at, at a certain point they'd come up with a bowl that takes a whole day or something, <laughs> and the water clock, the the water clock guy would get to just chill a bit. Yeah, <laughs> heavy duty. Okay, so I like I actually like this next clock, which we're jumping we're jumping forward to about 
like the 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 Romans, like Greeks and Romans. Okay, pretty simple. And I know I pulled up a Google search page here because there's a bunch of different ways to look at this. This is a candle clock. Pretty straightforward. Uh, candles are made a specific uh, diameter, and they know that it burns at a specific rate, roughly. And then you have markings either on the candy, candle itself or, uh, in this particular case, in a sconce on the wall. And the candle burns, and there you go. Here's another, here's another example. There's uh, the, actually even uh, some auctions that still use candles during their auctions. Come on. To, yeah, to measure the mean? time for, uh, for bidding. Fuck off. Yeah, I, I don't know which auctions, <laughs> but I've been there told is... by other watchmakers that they're, they're still in use. Just are I these, think out of are tradition. These like these are like watch auctions. They uh, use them for watch auctions. I haven't seen one at a watch auction. <laughs> that would be the most like meta, right? It would make sense. <laughs> the guys okay. that are using the record players yeah. might have those. Here as well. we've gathered today to <laughs> sell the world's finest and most precision timepieces. <laughs> uh, we will be timing the auction with this candle we sourced from the 1300s. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's silly. But this is neat. I mean, on you could make candles, I guess, um, different thicknesses uh, so they would burn at different rates or, or whatever. And uh, there you go. Candles. That that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> Cameron's riveting. Yeah, you, you could make uh, some COSC certified candles <laughs> they don't and have all any, sorts of things. I don't think they have any chronometer. <laughs> chronometer uh, grade candles? candles. Although, although, look, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know if this is real. This could just be something on that's on Etsy, frankly. I'm not really sure. But let's just yeah. assume I call BS on that. You call you call horseshit yeah. on this. So here we have candles that have. A we should buy them and just let them run. <clears throat> see what happens. <laughs> God, this podcast is taking <laughs> forever. You guys, <laughs> this is gonna be the thirty-hour show. I once did a live show, uh, twenty-four hours of Lamar. Me and uh, Mr. Zach Clapman and Mr. J.F. Musial and a few people attempted to to broadcast. L- real time for 24 hours for 24 wow. hours and we thought that <laughs> we thought it would be a really good idea to just start drinking on yeah. our hour one well if you start drinking on hour one hours five through six are great but hours like 12 to 20 are brutal yeah <laughs> you actually have you can be hung over twice in one race as it turns <laughs> out um <laughs> all right so Candles, water, sun. So far, it's all been like, let's call it passive timekeeping, right? Yeah. Natural elements do their natural thing at their natural pace. Yeah. And that is how we have kept time up until the year eh, 1500 or so. 1200. 12 to 1500. You right? Um. The mid one thousands to fifteen hundreds. Is that about yeah, what we're yeah. talking about here? Yeah, when we started to see uh, like clock towers and things like that. that right. Was well, that's where I want. That's where I want to go next. Right. Twelve hundreds. Okay. I wasn't yeah. totally off. So this is a clock tower, early clock tower, and you want to tell us about clock towers? Uh, well, th- this <laughs> one here is very different. I know very little about this one. Sorry, but, I just uh, found a fun picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one is apparently powered by water. Yeah. So there's a, a water wheel in there that's actually uh, there's flowing water that pushes the wheel and advances it, and that's actually attached to a gear train, uh, which then pushes. I would imagine the hands forward on the clock, but I don't see any display mechanism. Well, there aren't any hands on this particular clock. Right? On this particular clock, this this clock, the one I remember as I I've got the reason I got this picture wasn't because it would look so pretty. This is the first use of a mechanical escapement. In theory, now it's a drawing, <laughs> but the the clock tower it represents was just known as the water clock, right? Yes, and uh, it was basically like water gravity driven, uh, but it did ha- it did have an early form of an escapement in that the water wheel turned a series of gears and shafts, which then turned this sort of column that looked like either the leaning tower of Pisa or a spice rack <laughs> that has like little dancers on it. Yeah. And then that and then that the 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 column would sort of have a display outside and however these figures would dance, that's whatever the time meant. They didn't quite figure out hands. Yeah. <laughs> it was like it was oh. more of a an experiment in motion, I think. 
Yeah, it's more just like look at this yeah. machine. I I think it did it did actually keep some sort of time, and it did require uh some sort of uh ma- watching. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think there's there's a ladder that goes up next to it. I have a feeling somebody had to carry buckets up this yeah. fucking thing. I mean, <laughs> they're carrying buckets up to the top, and then they're putting the water down through here, and it should come into. These little cups somehow. Yeah, and then it, it looks like it goes into the trough, and then yeah. they scoop out another bucket and just carry that right back up the stairs. Yeah. That is a terrible gig. Yeah, and that... The never-ending running of the buckets up the stairs. Yeah, that's a stair, uh, scary staircase, too. It's kind of yeah, like a, a ladder staircase. Or... It, al- it almost looks in the right side here like you've got to go uh, upside down a bit. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like that's not... Like, like those cliffhangers where they do the, the crazy upside-down yeah. thing. Yeah. It's like the it's like the Anne Frank house ladder. <laughs> really? Um, all right. Well, so, so now we have mechanical escapements in the form of giant 25-foot towers uh, that are basically water wheels with transmissions or escapement gears on the back, kind of. What's next? We've got... We could jump to the 1400s, and you there might be something in between there and here, but I yeah, could... Yeah, is there? Uh, I mean, it, 1200s is where you started to see real clock tower, mechanical clocks in towers um, that were usually powered by some sort of weight that is lifted... And then as it slowly drops. Oh, really? yeah. Okay. Um, so the same thing as the water principle, uh, dragging the bucket up the uh, up the thing. I'm looking exactly. I'm, I'm right now googling. Oh, here we go. This looks that looks pretty. Well, that's 1769. I don't know if that's quite old enough. All right. So uh, let's see. We've got um, Saint Paul's Cathedral. I think. Oh yeah. Is one of the oldest records. Clock tower. Here we go. Oh, that's very pretty. Okay. I got you now. I got you guys. Don't worry about me. And I'm this on. one, they actually, so they have... Ooh, it's a skeletonized movement. And they would have had clock keepers, like you were talking about, yeah. uh, for other devices. But there's somebody who would actually man the clock and make sure that everything runs, everything's oiled. Um, they weren't as passive as current clocks, where you could set them and mm-hmm. let them go. They had to be constantly maintained. Yeah, like, so... Every time, you know, call it a five kilogram weight or whatever it was, you'd, you'd lug that thing up the stairs, attach it to the rope, right? And then just let with it a, go. With a big uh, yeah. ratchet system. Yeah. And then it would just slowly unwind itself as the weight went down the tower to like the floor or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. And presumably it would need adjustment like every single time. I, I, <laughs> I think every day it was, there was hands on work to keep it running. I mean, it's pretty cool. Is that is it still uh, working now? I believe so. Let me see if I can find uh, another better picture of it. It's a very cool... Oh, is this it right here? Yeah. This is it zoomed in. Okay, great. I gotcha. And it didn't say... I don't, I don't think it would be a bad gig. It's something I wouldn't mind. He was. It seems uh, like a pretty mellow job, yeah. right? And the guy was paid in, in beer and bread. Those are the, the records all, they That have. was all they had. Yeah. <laughs> frankly. So not, not such a bad deal. Now, this right now... We don't think in this photograph it's got we got Roman numerals uh with hash marks on the primary dial, but then in some like leafy sculpture it says sixty fifteen thirty forty five at at the corners is that were they using Roman numbers back then, or I guess so no the the Arabic numerals I'm, not, I'm sorry were they using Arabic numerals back then? That I don't know. We'd have to Roman. consult. Uh, someone in the someone is screaming at their radio. Like, Roman numerals, you fucking idiot! <laughs> yeah, I meant I meant were they using actual uh, English numbers back then? I don't know, because that looks like a like a later edition, doesn't it? It could be. Doesn't it look like someone stuck that on in like the 1900s <laughs> because people were like, uh, guys, no one can read yeah. Roman numerals anymore, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, but it's a very pretty clock. So that's like 1200s. Yes. Okay. So and there's that's a good example, but it's not definitely not the only clock tower. There's no, there's, a, there's, there's a bunch. There's other ones with records back to the the 1200s. Okay, man, I stand corrected. So let's <laughs> check out this guy. Now let's bump it up to like 1400. This is in Prague, and this is the first clock tower that has like crazy astronomical uh, complications. I just honestly, I don't know how to read it. 
uh, I mean, if we, we can zoom in and maybe, Cameron, can you tell me how to read any of that crap? Do you have any idea what any of that is? Yeah, it's so you have a you have a lot going on with time. Uh, you have things like solar time, true true noon. You have uh, uh, time as it deviates from that because okay. we actually we have to make everything work. So what we do is we make everything even numbers and we turn it into. 60 seconds every minute and, and 60 that turn, minutes like turning every into hour. A leap and, year, as, you know. Yeah, we want to have 365 days when, in fact, it doesn't take 365 days for a full uh, cycle of rotation. And it's just, it has a lot to do with uh, astronomy because we're basing everything from the very beginning to seasons and the sun going up. Uh, reaching its uh, its zenith and then going back down and going back up again. And that really is not... None of that is perfect numbers. It's close. But it's like close, it's not, but it's not perfect. So if you really want to have like so, yeah. a proper astronomical calendar, you kind of have to adjust for the little bits where the world isn't perfect yeah. or have a guy who adjusts, yeah. adjusts for it. So there's I'm, actually multiple... Um, types of time being told on one clock in this one yeah kind of so, like if you've seen equation of time complications on watches um no, that i haven't what is an equation of time complication? so the equation right, of time go, is actually and, let me go back and find this hang on what is it uh so equation of time will tell you the difference between <clears throat> your uh your mean solar time and true solar time I don't know what that means at all. Can you? Can so you the mean try? solar time <laughs> is we actually average out, so that we can figure out when noon is, because uh-huh. true noon is not really at twelve every day. That's not the time that the sun is the highest in the sky. Okay. We just pretend that for our clocks, just to make our lives easier. Yeah, it makes okay. lives easier. Yeah, so you can get um, to work at the same. same yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here, this is a Patek Philippe. Got a picture reference. Six ten two R O O one, and this, is this what you're talking about? Yeah, it'll actually be on the back side of that one. Oh damn it! T- type in Audemars Piguet equation of time, or okay. we'll see one here. We, this is a good one right okay. there. All right, here we That's go. That's easy. Okay, okay, man. So here, an equation of t- oops, sorry about that. <laughs> That's not gone well. <laughs> I, I zoomed in too far. Okay, here we go. What is the What is this watch? It's very beautiful. So we've got. These long hands that are actually telling you uh, how far off we actually are oh my from the true God. time. This it, this doesn't look like any... It looks like a Geiger counter or something. <laughs> it does not look like any watch I have ever seen. And with the exception of the primary hands, which are a normal hour and minute hand, and the date, I couldn't tell you what the hell any of that meant. Okay, so sorry if you're just listening, but what we've got are... Two off-centered, very long hands pointing across the dial onto a scales, right? Is that Would you say yeah. that's accurate? Okay, so tell us what these things do. So the, the simple explanation is that you look at your watch right now or, and say it's noon. You look at your watch. It says it's 6.31. <laughs> so noon tomorrow, look at your watch, <laughs> uh-huh. and then look at the sun and see how high the sun is, and then wait and see if the sun goes higher or if it goes lower. Okay. If the sun goes higher and your watch says noon, then your watch is technically wrong. It's correct for time telling, but it's not actually giving you true solar noon. This is a watch for fucking assholes. <laughs> this is a watch for someone yes. who wants to be an absolute pedantic yeah. asshole. Noon is actually in two minutes and 36 seconds. Actually, <laughs> it's not noon. Uh, well, my iPhone, you know, it's synced to like the atomic clock or whatever. I'm pretty sure my iPhone knows, no, my yeah. equation of time watch It's says, only taking an average, which is not oh, nearly accurate enough for everyone. <laughs> oh, please. If you ever wear one of these watches up to me, please show it to me, but do not tell me how wrong my watch is. But here's, so I literally in the, in the scheme of just this watch, the scales on the left seem to go from 3.30 to 9, and then from 15.30 
to 21 on the other side. Like, how do you read that? You so know? what happens is um, you can go from, I believe it's plus 14 minutes and change uh-huh. to negative 22 minutes and change oh. is how far off from uh, our clocks from true solar noon. Oh, my God. So that's why we've got this scale here uh, showing all the way to, it should be to 22 if it was really... If it was really, perfectly accurate, if it was actually good, yeah. you know, uh, it's a very that's a very pretty watch. I got to imagine something like that is comes with a serious price tag as well. Yeah, yeah. There is that. Is that not a crazy cheap. complication? I mean, as far as in the land of complications, right? Is that a a difficult one to manufacture? Yes, there's there's some difficult components, and typically when you find a watch like that, it's going to be paired with a perpetual calendar as well. Oh, okay, yeah. So which is another up. another time where we have the Gregorian calendar, and we actually where the day is not. We don't have 365 days in a year. It Correct. either has to be more or less, yeah. and that's why we have all the leap years and the um, every uh, every 400 years we actually are uh, skipping a leap year. As well, oh, do we? Yeah. Are there? Do the perpetuals account for that too? They should, because I know when you get a perpetual, like for those unfamiliar with this, a perpetual calendar is hours, minutes, seconds, days, date, month, and year, and generally the year is four digits, right? It doesn't have to be, but it it needs to be able to track the leap year. Track the leap, right? Yeah, and, and adjust. So if you keep the thing energized what is the term wound wound running it needs adjustment like every 150 years in theory right in theory that's that's standard there are perpetual calendars now that actually take into account the 400 year cycle really yeah like which one do you know um i believe iwc makes one uh i want to look at that one well the one I just had uh, as a loaner from Crown and Caliber, and I was so I had it for like think, think this crazy thing. One of these no, is, I believe it's this. This one. guy, wow, that's awesome. One, so I had the IWC Big Pilot Perpetual Calendar for twenty four hours from Crown. Yeah. They sent it to me, and then immediately sold it. <laughs> I had to <laughs> send it back, and I was so bummed because it was so cool. So here's the IWC. God, that thing is is hot. I'm not. IWCs are those watches. Like I know they're nice. I know, but like it's rare that they just like jump out at me. Yeah, that is hot. Right. So, okay. So this is a perpetual that does the adjust for the every four hundred. I believe so. Crazy. Not all of theirs have that in there, but it uh, they do make one that uh, that will adjust. So this that. has hours, minutes, seconds, day, date. What has, yeah, day? No, it has day. So, so the one with the red there is actually a power reserve because this oh, has a long power reserve. Yeah, there you go. So in, in case you're, you know, not around yeah. to keep your watch wound. or Seven days. Yeah. Wow. So this has, okay, minutes, hours, seconds, day, month, year. Moon phase. Moon phase, power reserve. Is this a chrono? That's uh, seconds, no, that's seconds. your running seconds hand over there on the left hand side. This little thing here in the uh, middle. that looks like some copyright stuff. Oh, okay, that's so I don't steal their picture. Yeah, okay, <laughs> got <laughs> it. And uh, yeah, four digit year, crazy, right? Yeah, and that's that's about five hundred grand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, wait. I think we've gotten away from ourselves though. <laughs> wait, why are we talking about perpetual calendars now? Where were we? Where were we? we oh, were the astro on... calendar. Yes. yes, the astro calendar. Back yeah. to the crazy ass. So the only thing I can recognize on the Astro calendar is a 24-hour hours on the outside ring, right? Uh, Here's one, and it goes all the way around to 24. So we have 24 time zones as well. Oh, shit. The, Do they have a, 24 time zones in the 1400s? I think not. The New um, World had not been discovered, bro. 24 time zones. No, the New World had not been discovered. They didn't have that in 1400. When did they come out with the time zones then? Not in 1400. You want to? You want me to go I, look? You want me to? You want me? Yeah, to let's, let's check right, this one. All right, I'm gonna do it. Here we go. But uh, so a lot of it has to do with uh, with stars okay. and seeing at what time the stars actually reappear every year. That was kind of the first fascination with keeping time was seeing seasons come and go and realizing that oh, 
winter's here. It's snowing, and then summer's going to come, and you know that winter will come again. Uh, you were off. November 1883, bro. Wah, wah. So we've got... <laughs> You're only 400 years off, though. Yeah. <laughs> so those are hours. Those are hours on that clock. That's not time zones. They did have 24 hours. And then these are these are signs of the Zodiac. Exactly. Right? And can I say that I only know that because of the 69? That's bad, <laughs> that, but that's true. I don't even know. Do you know which one? What are you? What sign are you? I am Cancer. None of these looks like... Wait, Cancer's the crab, right? That yep. could, This could be a crab on the left, maybe? It Fuck, can't. I don't know. What Sagitt- Sagittarius is the guy on the horse, is the, the, the man horse. None of these really look like man horse. Yeah. All I see is Pisces here, the 69. I don't know. Anyway. So this is all astronomical, and it's basically telling you alignment of you know where we are in the universe at a certain that's time so because that's supposed awesome. to be cyclical. It's so cool. Which it turns out it's not really it, that precise. All it is is super fucking pretty. Yeah. But but does but all of that is running off of one movement. There are not multiple movements to that, right? That's one movement. I that's believe the it's point. one mechanism. Yeah. That's that's the point. Yeah. All right, so that's 1400s. Now, we need to jump to now all of a sudden watches get small and people start carrying them. Well, the, is there the biggest in so from here mm-hmm. you would have gone to springs. Spring. Oh, now the invention of yeah. the spring. Instead of having weights and and these huge systems in order to to run the clocks, you could have a spring and a barrel. And that that was the difference between giant thing on a, yeah. that has to remain still, really. Yeah. The difference is portability. Yeah. Because you could carry a watch with you. You could carry a watch with you and it could be a lot smaller. Yeah. You could have one at your house. Ooh. If you were really just, fancy. Just don't even talk about this yeah. level. These levels of luxury, <laughs> like I can't even imagine them. Yeah. But you brought back your little pocket watch here, which is yeah. from the next period, I should we should say, right? Let's yeah. go to where is it? Pull it up. Oh, close. There we go. Close. Down a little. There it is. All right. All right. So talk about how this thing works. So this is a very old pocket watch, I think, from the 1700s. Um, It is key-wound, so you actually open it kind of like a clock. If you've ever had an old clock, you'll open this, if I can get it. This is how you would actually wind like a grandfather clock. Yeah, Yeah. you'd open it up, and you would go in there and turn your hands to where you want them, and you put a little key into that square um, right here, and you'll actually wind it. You'll turn it. Instead of turning a crown on a, a regular watch, you'll turn this little uh, little part here, which has a spring barrel. It looks like behind the it dial. looks like the plastic around the ignition cylinder of a 1994 Honda Accord. <laughs> right? It looks like if you, yeah. someone just missed a bunch. With yeah. The key. Oh yeah. I mean, it's beautiful. Is that dial enamel? Uh, I believe so. Or ceramic or some yeah, kind of something. Yeah, some something. Uh, some kind of. I, I think it's a. Uh, Ceramic. And you just set the time by physically moving Physically the hands. moving the hands, pushing them forward and back. And that's like, okay, I guess, right? Yeah. Ish. I mean, that's how it was made, That's right? how it was done back in the day. Can you open Just the... dirty, sweaty fingers and... And these, I mean, look, that thing, it's got to be like, if it was raining outside or cold, yeah. like, there's just, there's no way that would work, right? Well, the older the watch, the looser all the fits are for everything. <laughs> okay, yeah. They, they made these, be, and they knew... They were going to be opened with dirty hands, yeah. and they were going to be in a pocket, and lint was going to get in. That's very put. Show, they put were that, uh, uh, put that under the thing with it open. Yeah, so it's a it's a it's a semi exposed really there. Yeah, it's very exposed. This can all be opened up very easily, and it's meant to be opened. You can even adjust the uh, the timing of it's this so, watch just on your own, like you could do with a uh, Model T Ford. Yeah, <laughs> and just, just like the spark a, timing. Yeah, just like a clock you'd have, and you can. Change the the weight on the pendulum a little bit. Move it up. Move it down. Yeah, uh, it has a similar system that you can actually use, but this is a, a different escapement than we use today. There's a cylinder escapement, and it's under this little uh, decorative cover here. If I shake it a little bit, you can kind of you sort of here, see wait, the I'll, balance. I will wheel attempt. Arms. I'm going to attempt on. I know no one, nobody likes to hear me talk about the ins and outs of video, but I'm going to attempt to zoom in on that escapement. Let's see. Boom! Zoom in. Oh, there, there you we go. go. That works. So you see the yeah, balance? Yeah, that works. Yeah. You can see the balance wheel Yeah, boing, boing, underneath boing. there. Yeah. Oop. 
I don't want to scratch this. There we go. You broke it! <laughs> Thank God it's yours. <laughs> That's all I'm worried about. It's really when you zoom in, it's very pretty. Look like gold. Yeah. My fr- is that is it made of gold? No, it, this would have been all uh, all brass. They were. Uh, I was just at Barrett Jackson, and they were selling. I was doing a whole Instagram series on my Instagram. The smoking tire. Look at this. I'll just I'll pull it up because it's very convenient. They were selling totally offbeat doubloons. Yeah. Which how do you not love a doubloon? That I mean that actually did that doubloon went into the ocean roughly when that pocket watch was made. Yeah, it's a Spanish galleon doubloon. Don't get me started on shipwrecks and the history, and that's like a huge fascination of mine. Dude, we should do we should do a shipwreck conspiracy theory show. <laughs> the guy selling this doubloon was like, you 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 could probably guess, you know, he, giant shark tooth, yeah, you know, the biggest shark tooth you've ever seen. Necklace, yeah. you know, bracelet made of doubloons. I mean, just just ridiculous. It was awesome. <laughs> All right, back to the back to the actual show. So po- we're at pocket watches, and uh, women start getting some pocket watches done on bracelets and armbands and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the uh, what was the first the first pocket watch? I wrote down the year. Mm-hmm. Let's see what we got. Fourteen eighty two. Wow. So that's pretty old when they start, and that was actually before we had uh, the spring, the spring balance. What did you do? So it was. <laughs> what a do different, you do with it? It was a different uh, mechanism, I really. Never, I wonder. I have a. I have a not very accurate. website full of early pocket watches open. I wonder. Oh, here's a, whatever this is. Looks like a yo-yo. Is that it? Oh, he's uh, like, yeah. That looks like this, it. Yeah. yeah. This. This <laughs> definitely. If you're. If you're. That illu- was the first pocket watch right there. <laughs> if your illustration is like an oil painting from the Louvre. <laughs> Yeah, this is definitely it. Yeah. Whatever's going on there. And he, he obviously has all of his important possessions with him. He's got his <laughs> clock, his little pocket watch, and his he's dog, got his dog. His teapot. Right? I mean, he's basically you. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's you from the 1500, except he looks really surprised that this guy is taking a picture yeah. of him. It's like oil paintings about your pocket watch. There you go. Okay, so pocket watch is 1500s, and then... Uh, do you want to? Is there an is there an interim in between pocket watches and then the first time Louis Cartier puts one on a on a strap? There's for one Santos? very important invention. What's that? And that would be the balance spring. The so the balance hairspring, spring. what we know as the hairspring today, and used to be the balance spring. Yeah. So the the hairspring for regulation was massive, and that took us from uh, from the pendulum which was accurate, to having a smaller, more compact, accurate option. The other options that were compact were not accurate at all. Like, were there, what kind of other options were there? Uh, it's like slow-moving, spinning wheels that <laughs> oh, were like just, a, like, like, weighted. Rec- like a record? Like yeah, exactly, and they just kind of spin around, and you. I don't know how they regulated them, but it was basically just a spinning motion, and it was kind of, how fast can it spin? There's friction, and... Uh, drag and things like that. So to go to the oscillating balance wheel was um, a huge step. And then that just... I have that one in the bag right there. Uh, yeah, and then, well, yeah. this is the, the mainspring. Oh, that's a mainspring. So this, oh, was, okay. this was prior to that, but this is what allowed you to go to smaller, more compact clocks and portable clocks because you had a spring instead of having to have a, a giant stone or right. buckets of water that you carry up uh, some kind of crazy ladder. Okay, so this allowed it to be normal sized, a yeah. main spring. Yeah. The hairspring allowed it to be accurate, accurate in a small when you're, size. When, yeah. in a, when you're moving it around all the time and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, see, I'm an idiot. I yeah. can admit that I'm an idiot. But Otherwise, if you look at, at, he went uh, to watch school. at other know. accurate uh, <laughs> clocks and things, you'll yeah. have pendulums. Yeah. The pendulum is extremely accurate. However, it's that's, big. That's grandfather clock. Yeah. Right. Is that, what's. I mean, I guess there's got to be some little tiny one somewhere, but the yeah, there's there's desktop uh, <laughs> pendulum clocks, but they shouldn't be moved, right? Um, <laughs> that, you've also got something that's really cool, the Atmos clock. What's that? So the the Atmos clock what that has is. a bellows. What? And with temperature change in the room, the air in the bellows expands and contracts. Uh, what am I looking at here? Is there, are these all Atmos clocks? Yeah, those are all Atmos okay, clocks. Okay, wait. What's what's a good pick? That's a, that looks like a very old one, right? Should we go with yeah. that or should we go with this? Um, 
go with one of these ones that's a little more okay. open. What is that? That's extremely cool. So Wait, in the up. in the wow. back of this clock, it's very pretty. Yeah, yeah. And at the bottom, you can see the uh, the wheel here. That's actually going to be going back and forth. Oh, so this this big uh, tray is hanging underneath the face of the clock. Exactly. That's part of your back escapement. And forth. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. But behind the the clock mechanism that's in the center here, mm -hmm. you have this bellows, and it's just just in, like it's just uh, it's in opening out, and in closing out, in, in out, out in out, and it's winding the watch and keeping it running. So does a pendulum that this spinning weight on the bottom is that that's spinning back and forth yeah get moves the bellows which then no the bellows is heat so as your house uh Wait, warms what? up during the day the bellows expands from oh, the air come expanding on. this works yeah this they're, works they're very reliably? accurate really yeah. yeah what if you what if you're you what if you're in a, a climate controlled house at 72 all the time it takes very little temperature change to Seriously? operate the bellows. Yeah. Does it? What if it? What if you put it in a closet? Does it work then? If it's always in, it does. It, the the temperature has to. You would probably have to have it really? in some sort of like refrigerator. Come on. Uh, to I keep it from working, I think. I don't believe it. Wait, where's the back? I want to see. Can we find a picture? Uh, type of the back? in Atmos bellows. Atmos clock bellows. There's got to be. Is there? There's got to be some kind of animation. Here we go. Shit. Okay. What? What's a good illustration? Uh, right here. Okay, this there is we good. go. Yeah, all right, here we go. So in all the right. back here. So here on the on the on the right is the. Oh, tell me I don't ruin this. Okay, oh, this there, is a good perfect. picture. Clock face on the right. Mechanism, or uh, I guess we can call that. So that big one right there is your barrel. So there's an actual a, spring in there that needs to be wound. Okay. In here you have the bellows inside of this uh, drum. A big cylinder. Yeah, yeah. it's like a Tommy gun drum or right? something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So inside the bellows, tiny little movements of the uh, uh, the internal parts in there that are actually yeah. the bellows opening and closing will slowly wind up the mainspring, just like an automatic watch on your wrist has a weight, and the back and forth of the weight winds up the spring. That's so crazy, though. Yeah. Like, you have to move your your wrist kind of a bunch to get your, yeah. the weight to do anything. I mean, how much could this bellows move? I, I think just a fraction of a degree wow. causes really? the bellows to move. Wow. Yeah. I am so glad you're here because I've <laughs> never heard of any of this shit, and it's so crazy. The stuff that people... Is this considered a success, this clock? A failure? Is it... I mean, I've never even heard of I one. I think it was a success. It was a, what what period of time are we talking about with this? These were around, I believe, in the 50s and 60s. Hmm. They were pretty popular. There's earlier I, examples and later examples. I think JLC is still making them. They, well, the first image I showed up. Look, these are yeah. here's Google Shopping. These things are. Yep. I mean, you just go. This just, is a this is a more current just one. Just right straight there. Google. One hundred and five grand. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit! Wait right? a second. One hundred five thousand dollars. Yeah. So that's a, a special oh Mark Newson. Uh, God. Yeah. What the fuck? It looks like a two thousand and three iMac. One hundred and five thousand dollars wow okay right. all right wow i mean but the the older ones from the 60s there you can get them for a couple of thousand well, dollars and they're that's, really that's nice real and unique yeah kind here's, of mantle clocks here's one uh here's one for like seven grand oh no i can't i don't even think i can uh well sorry sorry crown and caliber <laughs> i apologize for pulling up a different retailer's website but that one's 5800 bucks maybe crown and caliber has one i'll look later if crown and caliber has one you should buy one from crown and caliber but that's now you thanks cameron now there's something else that's 10 grand that i want yeah that's super cool last time when we talked about um those accutron watches out of nowhere like two people emailed me like you'd almost think that they were bots, they, yeah, and it was cookies or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But this computer's not connected to any of my other accounts intentionally. You sure your phone wasn't listening, dude? <laughs> fucking Siri is on this one, but no, I had humans email me about their Accutrons. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I'd never heard of this thing. Then we talk about it. Now here it is. I'm gonna have to watch these cookies later and yeah. see if, <laughs> see if. Uh, all right. Okay. Wow. How about that? Atmos clocks. Very cool. Where are we in time in history right now? Uh, well, I mean, that one's pretty late. That's that's sixties. Where I were think, we? Oh, we were we were right back. back we were, here. Uh, yeah, 
We were when watches got onto people's wrists. Yeah. And that was a big step, especially yeah. this guy, because he made it cool for men to wear watches. Right. And so before this... him, it was really only women with jewelry pieces, and the watchmaking side was backseat. It wasn't such a... Uh, it wasn't so so much a mechanical item as it was a jewelry item. Yeah, and uh, you know we were we uh, we men were wearing a lot of top coats, so we had a lot yeah. of pockets going on. Yeah. Then, like all of a sudden, fewer top coats. Yeah, you know, I'm so glad this happened. I mean, actually, I'm a fan of pocket watches. Like back in the day, like in high school, and when everyone was doing the wallet chain. Yeah, That's, I'm 36. Everyone was doing the wallet chain when I was in high school. I didn't want to do the wallet chain. I didn't like the wallet chain, but I liked the chain. And I had a I had the fossil pocket watch. Wow. Remember that one? I remember that. I yep. mean, it's just, you know, it's quartz, so like all of, you know. Yeah. But in high school, it was like it was like a well-made. I remember it was a few hundred dollars, and it was like a well-made item, and I rocked my fossil pocket watch in high school, and that was like my first quote legit watch. Yeah. But this guy, and his name was Santos, uh, he was a pilot, and he asked his friend Louis Cartier, who was a watchmaker, uh, before Cartier was... I mean, was Cartier Cartier at this point? I mean, he was making watches, but was it, it wasn't this, you know, super... It was more a local thing, right? Yeah, it, I, I don't believe... So it was more of a, a jewelry item at, at that time in history. Yeah. It was jewelry and pocket watches, but it was kind of like taking a mechanism probably from outside of Geneva and then pairing it with yeah. with a, a case. And so they were designing something beautiful, but not necessarily doing any kind of watchmaking, right. if that makes any sense. Yeah, They're, yeah. But they, they were, were creating the, jewelry the design. And then just kind of putting a watch yeah, into it. Yeah, putting a watch it. into yeah. it. Yeah. And you can still buy. They still... Cartier still makes shit like that. I mean, you yeah. go on Cartier's website, oh, yeah. and they've got some thing that's like 200 grand and it's got some little janky ass quartz movement in it right yeah i mean you can like yeah. it's it's oh, all yeah. it's rubies and diamonds and craziness but like the the and yeah it's got a watch on it but the watch is like you know you need a magnifying glass to read it the yeah. hands are like barely there and it's just it's all about some panther that's wrapped <laughs> around your wrist and diamonds yeah. but this is like this original cartier i mean you can see you can buy a Cartier today that looks basically exactly like yeah. that. Yeah, you could still get the Santos. Yeah, is this but the, the the current Santos is slightly different, isn't it? Yeah, it it should have uh, screws on the bezel right. on the the Santos now. Yeah, but same shape. The overall shape of the case is the same. Um, still has the square uh, in the dial like that. Oh wait, I thought I. Oh yeah, here we go. This that's the current one, right? Yes. Okay, here we go. Here. Here's the current Santos. Oh no! Don't kill me. Loading. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I should wait. I should wait till the photos load. There it is. Hi, hi, Santos. It's a very. Th this is th this current is is very nice looking. Is it um big? How big is that? It's got to be small, right? Based on the size, they of that have strap, a, a good range be. of it now. That one is a small one. Do they have the? But bro, it ranges. It they ranges have the, from the, women's the Panerai competitor, like you yeah. Know, Oh, they, do oh, they, a, make, they, have a they make one of these that's like a brick. They do? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I was walking in a watch store the other day, and I, there's a, a company called U-Boat. You seen them? <laughs> I've seen them. I don't think they make a single fucking thing under 50. <laughs> so everything, it's like a manhole cover. Yeah, and it's got a cage over it, <laughs> yeah, and a, it's, it's got some sort of cap on the the crown. It's crazy. Yeah. But if you if you got a big, like, what's your wrist around? Uh, I have a pretty small wrist. I'm, I, I have like a seven and... A quarter inch wrist, I think, so or seven I got and a half inch. Straight eight, yeah, even eight. So you got, I got to wear some beastie shit. Yeah, your Although watch, I, your watch is about as small as I can go. The white watch. I used to wear uh, the Audemars Piguet dive, diver, and that was, I forget that's what they like, measure it at. That's big, right? It's a big watch. Yeah. They say forty two millimeters, I think. Yeah, but it's really like. Uh, but if you really measure it, it was like fifty <laughs> millimeters across. Well, maybe they're just talking about the dial, yeah, and it's got the, exactly. The it's octagon. got the big crown yeah, how guards. Do you measure an octagon. It's yeah, not... it, so it's it's definitely bigger. You got to do calculations for square footage and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so now finally, holy shit! Forty six minutes into the show, <laughs> <laughs> we got some good history. I every show we've done so far, I'm I'm going like, oh, this is you know, are we, I hope we got enough. Yeah, this will be quick. 
And <laughs> now we're 46 minutes into the show and watches just got on wrists. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> We're not going to go all the way to the Apple Watch. No one gives a shit about the Apple Watch. We're going to stop when wa- and analog watches. I yeah. Think, right? Should we just throw the the smart watch under the bus? Because we're we're not smart watch people. Yeah. I, I just I can't do it. All right. So I can't do the smart watch thing. So if you, if you were listening to this one, <laughs> smart watches at the forty six yeah, seven minute do- mark, <laughs> you can go away now. <laughs> oh, bye. All right. Watches are on people's wrists. Uh, I'm gonna bump us up to 1910. I don't have a great, don't have a great picture right here, but 1910, uh, a Rolex watch, and apparently this is what the the certification looks like. A Rolex watch in 1910 was the first wristwatch in the world to receive the Swiss certificate of chronometric precision, granted by the official watch rating center. Yeah, buddy. Go Rolex. Good for you. And uh, then in 1914, um, they granted a Class A precision certificate. What does that mean, Cameron? Do you know? I have no idea. <laughs> this no, Chances are this was all stuff that Rolex started. Well, this is Rolex's website. Yeah. Do you think they came up with the official watch rating center and then gave themselves an award? Yeah. That's usually how it starts. That shit is so gangster. I love it. Although... I do, I do, it does say here, granted we're reading Rolex's website, uh, until that point, that certificate had been reserved exclusively for marine chronometers. Yeah, and Rolex probably bought the, <laughs> the certification institute and then opened it up to wristwatches. I, I just, uh, I just heard a, a story from a friend of mine about a company that, a guy that was uh, pre- preparing for, to defend himself in a massive lawsuit, and his response was to buy a law firm. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, you're on a whole other level yeah. there, aren't you? I mean, there's also rumors that Rolex bought back that Paul Newman Daytona for $17 million. They denied it uh, officially, but I think it's it's not implausible that that would have yeah. happened. Um, so, uh, the, so Rolex, uh, you know, Marine wristwatch, that sort of... Starts this super precise uh, thing, and here we here we go. Oop, close, you got Ooh. very close there, Cameron, with this Rolex Datejust. Is that? Ooh. Does that what seem out of focus? Out of is that slightly out of focus? Nineteen forty-five. It's launched. Waterproof oyster. That's a, that's a thing. That becomes a thing. Yeah. The uh, so no watch is ever waterproof. <laughs> Water resist. Water resistant. Resistant, sorry. Waterproof means that it will run even if it has water in it. Oh. Oh, I didn't I never so had made that something distinction. Something that's something that's waterproof is not damaged by water, basically. Oh, all if right. you have a, a piece of plastic, it's not damaged by water. It's waterproof. If you have a piece of steel, it's damaged by water, it will <laughs> rust. So it's not waterproof, it's water resistant. Oh, okay. So watches can only be water resistant. Um and that's that's, that's a good. That's a. That's a. You know, that's, that's a, a supreme a, distinction. A dude. lot of people say waterproof to me, and I, 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 most of the time I fight back the urge. No, you're right, dude. <laughs> but uh, this is the, exactly the spot for correcting yeah. that sort of that sort of filthy language. <laughs> so for Rolex, I believe with the uh, the Oyster case, they they had an automatic movement. And that's how they made it a first. Uh, was having an automatic movement automatic. inside of a water resistant case with a Cyclops date wheel. Yeah, they, exactly. <laughs> On you, a Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. In Bern. Or exactly with a five link style bracelet. So there, there had to be some they extra made up caveats. Their own, they made up their own game there as well, probably. Yeah, and that you always have to watch out whenever companies are saying that they were the first at anything. Yeah, you have to read a little further and see what they also did. <laughs> <laughs> to make it an actual first, right? Um, like, did they murder the patent officer? Uh, yeah, is that yeah. a is that a com- is it a, a common thing for shadiness to be going on in these first? And- yeah, because innovate a, a true innovation is so rare, right? Yeah, it, it's all borrowed from the past, right? It's it's really, I mean, there's a, a lot of history in watchmaking, all the way back from the clocks, and a lot of things happened, and then. We kind of built upon them and changed them a little bit or made something smaller, but it's not necessarily new. Yeah. It's just slightly altered from the previous version. At what point, let's, 
I mean, okay, so cert- but certain things become new. Like we can in a minute. Uh, well, let's end this with the new analog shit. I have one yeah. watch in mind, and we can we can we can go back to it. But let's go with the uh, we we start with the, uh, the Yager. Right? So the the complications now on the wristwatch is a new thing. So uh, this is I'll zoom in. This is very pretty. This is from the forties. Yager, you can. I can't even pronounce it right. Uh, Je Lacolt. Fucking way. I'm so way off. So this is a triple calendar from uh, from the 40s. Um, we talked about JLC on uh, on one of the other shows. Um, important because they provide movements to the other big name companies. Yeah. So do, what are you uh, what are you into about this thing? Um, I like really. The movement is something you would have seen in a lot of watches from that time. So the movement is not particularly special. Mm-hmm. But I really like the lugs on this case. Teardrop lugs, right? they're called. Exactly. They're very pretty. I, oh, I zoomed in a little, just a little too far. There we go. Much better. And those lugs, <clears throat> you just don't see lugs like that today. They're all much more regular. Well, they don't, is, ex- ex- they don't like pop out of the case like that exactly you know, they're all kind of like just you know integrated just seamlessly into yeah. the case it's whereas like, this was made in multiple parts and then it was put together by somebody who's a uh, a jeweler or a goldsmith or something he actually made that case to that design uh very different than how watch cases are made today god we are gonna have to change the lighting in this room we'll yeah figure out a shade situation right? or something i feel like to tilt that box. thing to the side or something, the, ugh, that's not. I, yeah. I'm, it's not good. We're gonna have to figure it out. For those on the video portion of it, believe you me, it has not escaped us that some watches look like total hot steaming garbage <laughs> under our light. We got fluorescent lights in this place. We we're doing our best. We're trying. I I love this watch so much. I but uh, and it's got uh, day and date, which is cool. Was it wait? Was it month day date? It's got uh, so it's got the day of the week. It's got the month, and you've also got the day of the month around the dial in red. And there's a hand from the center that actually picks uh, shows you the day. I feel bad. I walked away. Or the date. Uh, yeah, there's the there's an actual a ring around yeah. uh, around the whole thing, and it goes around and shows you. It's so if you're reading cool the calendar mechanism, you've got red on everything that is calendar related. That's super cool. Yeah. Actually, I think someone somebody recently nicked that idea for a newer watch where there's a, a red dot that goes around and indicates a yeah. day of the month or something like that. Yeah. Someone just, someone, just, it, you know, honestly, it could have even been one of the new Yag- Yager. <laughs> so you've even got like the Rolex uh, Sky Dweller. Oh, that that's what it was. It was the Sky Dweller. Yeah. The Sky Dweller has the red yeah, dot that a goes display around. that is jumping around behind the dial, really. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. was at uh, Barrett Jackson, and I mean, I could do. We could do a whole show on just the watches <laughs> of Barrett Jackson. It was very, very funny. But like, if you have a sub or like a two tone gold steel GMT, you know, or whatever, you ain't got shit. You yeah. have a straight Camry. You need to be. <laughs> I saw some really wild stuff. I saw some like very complicated watches, some that kind of love. I saw some of those like crazy diamond covered, like super obnoxious thing. You know, very very interesting. Sorry, we're way off topic yeah. with that, but that's crazy. I wish I could uh, wear that. It looks on my gorilla hand. It looks very very silly. <laughs> um, and then if we bump up the the time period from there, actually, we can go with this guy. So. This one, uh, one of the guys from Crown and Caliber sent to us. It's a really interesting watch. It's called a. Is that the Breitling or is that the? Yeah, oh, Breitling. I, oh, whoops. Well, Breitling Top Time. Yeah, let's do Breitling Top Time. Oh, Sorry. You want me to switch? I, no, 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 no. Actually, in hindsight, that may have worked out better. <laughs> it may have, if I can find my note. There it is. Um, I like this watch. Because there's a fun controversy about it related to racing driver Jim Clark. It was attributed to be his watch, but it actually wasn't. He was actually wearing another watch, which I found that's like a big thing in like the Wikipedia of this <laughs> watch is that it was attributed to Jim Clark, but but not. Um, it was like popular with uh, actors and celebrities. Uh, 
yeah, from the early '50s, and it was made all the way into the '70s, and it's sort of an an entry level uh, chronograph. Um, it's a nice little watch. Yeah, it's not it's not like big and crazy. Like if you look at Breitling's watches today, you would almost not think they came from that. Yeah, do, we've got one. We can. Do you want to uh, smash the top yeah. time out of the way <laughs> to show you what grand well, we what can, its grandson looks like? We can only like? fit the crown. <laughs> Well, here we Let's go. Let's see. Ooh. Ooh. It's, <laughs> yes. Let's you do go, a side profile. You go on from these, like so. a 35 or 36 millimeter to a 49 yeah. <laughs> millimeter beast. Um, you can hear that hit the table there. Yeah. Um, so I, what's interesting, I think, about that that top time is it's not actually Breitling movement. It's a Valju movement. So, yeah. yeah it was seven, 72. 30, 73. Wait. Eh, one day I'm gonna figure out how to seven seven three three, seventeen jewels. Yep. Um, what we had that as a part of history because it was because Breitling, uh, is an important company. I feel like they don't get a lot of respect. I still <laughs> love Breitling. Yeah. However, I did watch a video by Breitling, and it was. I didn't watch the whole thing. It was like 45 minutes of them just showing pictures of their current lineup of watches. Okay. Just one after the next, sliding across the screen, basically. And I was expecting more of uh, maybe the artistry behind the watch, uh-huh. the watchmaking, the process. But no, it was just pictures of watches for 45 minutes. All the different dial colors, minutes. all the different styles, everything. It's like the nine eleven of watches. Like there's yeah. some. I don't want to. No, I, the Ro, really Rolexes are the nine elevens of watches. But I, it's just crazy. Yeah, there's so many. <laughs> and I that I, that one on the left is interesting because it's something I kind of hate. It's Breitling for Bentley. Yeah, which I fucking hate co branded stuff like this. I so it doesn't bother me if it's like. The Tiffany Paddock Philippe, like if it's a retailer, but like when a connection, I think the connection between cars and watches is so obvious already. It's so obvious. And, and beyond you need watches the time car racing, the connection but with the machines and the yeah. precision, it's so that you don't need to stamp the name of the car on it. Yeah. That's just, and that that's just my opinion. But I agree. Um, the top time is cool. If you want to wear this vintage stuff, though, you got to have a small wrist. Yeah, but even this one, though, this is a, a thicker vintage let me, watch. Let me, let me see that thing. We're gonna this try, is I'm really gonna a pretty burly. It's not burly. as vintage goes. As far as vintage, yeah, if you, as far as vintage goes, it's it's burly, but there's no, like this, I can't wear this. Look at that. That doesn't look right. Look at that. That looks too small. I think that looks too small. It's not like horrible. Yeah. But uh, but that's a that's a big vintage watch. If you're a big no, give me the give me the <laughs> give me the sledge. Pass me the sledgehammer over here. See, this thing is like it is, really is like swinging a hammer. Yeah. It's so heavy. Wow. But you have to be you careful have, when you go to. But when you, know, you have big grab gorilla something. hands, it 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 scales. Yeah, it does. <laughs> when I wore this, I, everyone I know who I met or who I know who was a, just a giant meathead. <laughs> Everyone else was like, ugh. But everyone who was a giant meathead absolutely yeah. loved that thing. Okay. Um, so that's Breitling is, is important in history. They're very aviation important. Aviation, and, and they still sponsor those Red Bull air races and yeah. yachting. Um, you know, they're involved in the sports that uh, watch people do. Yeah, and like, I still think they have some really great designs on certain timepieces. Now but they I make th- a lot of stuff that I absolutely hate. <laughs> uh, I want to see, because I feel like if I look at Bentley's effort at Le Mans, yep, as expected, look at this. Mm-hmm. You look right here on the front fender of the Bentley race car, and you see Breitling. There it is. Yeah, they uh, they co-sponsored Bentley's Le Mans effort. Shazam! Uh, Okay, so we've got watches that go in the air. How about we go with watches that go underwater? The dive watch. The dive watch in the 50s and 60s became hot shit. Yeah. 
Um, it was all about the depth. It was all about who could go the deepest and uh, and who was the first to do it. So I I think this is a really neat watch. The Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms, the first ever dive watch. And uh, this one in particular that we have a picture of is the mil spec, which actually says mil spec on it. Um, they use tritium, and there was a civilian spec that did not use tritium. Uh, and there's now a reissue um, for for of that that looks a little different that that I was wearing. Uh, I got on a loan from Crown and Caliber. It's pretty cool, but um, and super cool with these things. They were really they were tools. Yeah. So they have you know the the moisture sensor in there. And something like Where's that. Where's the moisture? Is that with this dot yeah. is in the middle? Yeah. Above the six is a moisture sensor? Was it change Yeah, change color? colors. Yep. Ew. Yeah. So it, things like that, it just, it makes you realize that they were actually designed for use. Same yeah. thing with the bezel. You had to have these things. They were just figuring out diving and how to yeah, not the, die the, when you the, dive. The big glowing or brightly yeah. lit numbers, the bezel that you can turn uh, to time your dives, um, you know, they're, that you can't. You can't bring a chronograph underwater because the buttons, yeah. if you push them, water will go in. Yeah. That's sort of just how life works. Although this particular uh, Daytona has screw-down chronograph buttons, um, which we can get to in a minute. And but, there um, are buttons you can press press underwater. Oh, are there? there are certain watches that, that have buttons you oh, can press Oh, do you know underwater. of any offhand? Um, I, the, yeah, the one of the well-known ones is the... Omega, uh, Seamaster. Oh, the Seamaster, Seamaster with chronograph. The chronograph. You can run that underwater. Yeah. Oh, okay, good to know. Yeah, good to know. Um, we talked about the Seamaster three hundred on the other show. I don't have one here. Uh, we had to send it back. <laughs> wah, wah. But uh, and then you have, of course, the uh, the Rolex Submariner, and this one's a mil sub. It was a military issue one. Uh, so the Seamaster, the fifty fathoms, and the Rolex were uh, the three main dive watches in the. 50s and 60s. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think. Yeah, the, the Blanc Pond was the... That was technically the first, like, ISO dive watch. Right. Where you had the uh, the rotating bezel, you had the glowing second hand, you had the water resistance, all those, all these little rules that you have to meet in order to be a, an ISO diver. A fathom is six feet. I believe, and 50 fathoms of them would be 300 feet. Yeah. Well, that's correct, yeah. right? I know the Seamaster went to 200 meters, which is roughly 600 feet, right? Yeah. yeah that's what the Seamaster did in 57, according to my notes. And then what does it say for the Submariner? Rolex was 1954, I believe. Was 54? The, sub, the Submariner, yeah. Okay, what does this say? 200 then, meters. Yeah, it would have been 200 meters. Six, 60, 600 feet. However, I I think there might have been the first Submariner was less, maybe. I could be wrong though. I don't I don't know their first one if it was like a. It would go yeah. way beyond where a human would die. Yeah, that to me is what's so funny about dive watches is all of them go. I mean, even like I'm actually a scuba diver. Like I am, uh, I I enjoy diving. I'm a scuba diving instructor. Actually, I was before I stopped paying my insurance. I'm still a <laughs> dive master, and uh, and and all. Even if you're diving on like trimix and like these crazy different, you know, you can dive with like multiple tanks that have different mixtures of nitrogen and oxygen and, yeah. and stuff. So so you can actually go deeper than if you were just diving with a normal tank of air. But all of these watches will go far beyond where a human would die. <laughs> yeah, with with regular <laughs> scuba equipment. Yeah. You don't want to do it. Well, even so, even with, without regular, what you know, what do you like? James Cameron's going down in his little submarine, but like he's in the submarine, he yeah. could be wearing a paddock Caltrava in that little submarine, <laughs> and it will work just yeah. fine. He doesn't need a helium gas escape valve. Unless, maybe, uh, maybe if you're, you know, on the re a rebreather or something right now, and the free divers, free yeah, diver. free divers were a free diver. Okay, that has right? that solves that. If you're a free diver, a Rolex Deep Sea would make sense because you actually are going. Yeah, and what what are the the free divers are? Well, so they're around like 800 feet, or they, they were go deep as right? hell, and they they hang on to like weights. Yeah, sled. And they go down right? a sled and then they lift bag it back up. I yeah. mean, that shit is so crazy. 
It's so crazy. And the reasons they can do that and are because they're not breathing compressed air. They do it on one breath. Yeah. They hold and their I breath. believe Blanc Pond sponsors some free divers. I wouldn't be I think they have a, have some maybe a couple people on a, a team. Blank pa- Blanc Pond free diving. Yep. Yep. There oh, cool. Go. Look at this. Fu- that's awesome. Look at that. This is a guy. Oh, I'm going to let you all down now. I'm all floating. I'm sorry. <laughs> I jumped the gun again. Our internet. Oh, come on. We'll come, we'll come back to it. It was basically... Here, we'll just go to the Google Google results. Blanc Pond Freediver. Look at this uh, little torpedo he's riding. That shit is dope. So these guys hang on to a weight and then go down to like... 800 feet, 500 fathoms, bro. Whoa. <laughs> is that what this is? Is this, is this a 500 fathoms? And what do they, they call that? Like this a, is the an new watch. descent That's or dope. something? This new watch is hot. That looks great. I'd like one of those. What is this? That's actually an older model. Is it? Yeah. Oh, that one's well, been out for a while. Well, it's newer than the, the one we just looked at. Yeah. Which is like a, quite a bit. Ancient. But yeah. All right. Cool. So they're, they Blanc Pond is definitely doing the free diving for sure. Yeah. Faux show. That's extremely cool. That was um that there. And then okay, I guess the opposite of the uh the opposite of the underwater then would be the outer space. Yeah. Right? God, I feel like we've talked about the Speedmaster in every single episode. It's two, that, uh, two minutes on the Speedmaster. It went <laughs> to space. It was the it was the the choice up oh, almost. It was the choice of NASA. They did some tests. We've gone over what those tests were. It passed the very rigorous test. Yeah. But I actually love that watch. I wish there was an extra link on that watch so I could send back this. And then I guess would I guess the Speedmaster brings you to chronographs uh and Daytona's yeah. again. Shachonk. Speedmaster versus Daytona. What's your what's your take, Cameron? Uh, I Ooh. like the I like the Speedmaster. Um yeah, I would go. I would go Speedmaster. You go Speedmaster. Yeah. Up until this week, I would have said Daytona every time. Except I've now been wearing this Daytona for a week, and it's very nice. But I have come to the realization: it's really hard to tell time on. <laughs> yeah, it's really not good at so, telling time in terms of just straight legibility. Yeah, it is a little tricky. It, with the silver hands and all the silver so parts on the dial, and silver yeah. and black and silver and black and silver, and it's actually the the loom isn't unless like you look you know charge up the loom yeah. you know but just in normal everyday use the loom isn't that bright at night and there's very little loom on there's that there's very yeah. little loom and then it, during sort of the sunset where it's not dark enough for like the loom but it's not br- you know what I mean yeah that middle ground. It's really hard to read. <laughs> like, are there? There might be other uh, dials. Other maybe dials, that, yeah, that are that easier. Platinum dial or whatever that's like sort of a bluish or something that might be easier. But I don't. I don't really think I like it that much. Actually, I think it's hard to read. I like my GMT better. My GMT is very legible. Yeah. So, anyway, that's uh, Speedmasters, and then and then Daytona's, and now we're at Chronographs. And where do we want to go with today? That's pretty much to now we're on to now we've got new materials really right now it's like right what yeah. is what is modern and you're a modern watchmaker well, what's really what does modern, modern watchmaking look like what's really modern right now is going to be new escapements that have long power reserves and when i say long power reserve i don't mean like 8 days i mean months whoa years. how does that how does that happen uh, you... A completely re-engineered escapement that doesn't actually require as much motion for the watch to run. So instead of dividing a wheel up into uh, like 15 teeth and like an es- escape wheel uh-huh. with 15 teeth on it and each tooth is advancing every second or something like that, uh, something like that will unwind relatively fast. Okay. Whereas if you change the escapement so that there's less movement happening, uh, less rotation of the wheels, yeah, you'll actually be able to extend the power reserve. Wow. So there's there's some so different how, people how, experimenting with new escapements that have really long power reserves. So I think one of 
I actually had the the the, the treat of going to um, Ulysse Narden um, mm-hmm. factory when I was in uh, in Europe, which yeah. I highly recommend. If if anyone out there goes to this part of Europe, you can tour most of these places. They have you know organized tours. It's like a thing they do, and it's super super interesting. So Ulysse Narden was talking about they have a thing called an anchor escapement. That's yeah. a completely different type of escapement. I am not even going to attempt to explain what it is. There's animations online for it. It's very complicated. Yeah, we could, we should do a a show that is just on escapements. Just on some of these unique escapements. All right. I'm gonna. I'll tell you what, Cameron Weiss. I'm gonna write that down in my notebook. Yeah. Unique escapements. Um. Because especially right now with the new materials and being able to, um, essentially. Not 3D print, but there are other processes that are similar to printing parts. Mm-hmm. Instead of removing material, you're you're adding material. So there's additive manufacturing that is able to make these tiny little parts in ways that have never been possible before. Because you don't need to like hold it. Yeah, you right? don't need to. You it don't need to need vice to, it in it, a machine. Yeah, it doesn't need to be. Uh, you can you can make parts that are hollow. You could have a. Comp- oh yeah. And like SpaceX is doing things yeah, like that, yeah. where they're making parts that have internal geometries and framework that you can't see. Interesting. And you'd never be able to machine that out. Yeah, because you're talking about the inside yeah. of fundamentally a solid block yeah. or something. So this watch, I thought, this is, I think this is one of the coolest watches you can get right now. This is like a hundred grand. And this is called the Freak Vision. It was just relaunched by Ulysse Narden. So Ulysse Narden is obsessed. I'm not that into their like basic watches, but their high-level stuff is super crazy. And so they're obsessed with lowering frictions. So they use this silicone stuff or silica, silica, sil- uh, silicon, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, and this watch, the entire assembly rotates, and then the the uh, with a gear that is that goes around the outside of the dial, like just craziness. The the first time I saw one of the older freak watches, the original freak, here, the original one. Back. Here's the original freak. Is this one right? Oh, that's a terrible picture. Um, I apologize. Yeah, that, that's one of the original movements. There's been that's, some, this is some different freak. iterations. Yeah. This. Uh, sorry. Continue. But when I when I first saw, yeah, the this freak, is the original freak. That was when I said I want to be a watchmaker. Just just crazy. I met the guy who designed this at the factory. Yeah. Yeah. He. T- I can't remember his name, but he was super super cool, and he explained how the anchor escapement worked, and he explained how this worked, and it was just the neatest thing ever. Yeah. Um. It's not. It's not super complex. But it's a unique way of laying everything out, uh, not only for the visual aspect, but right. the mechanical aspect. It's kind of like a tourbillon where you have the whole movement kind of spinning. Um, the whole gear train is moving. And and then, so now, you know, you've got stuff like that where they're just completely rethinking, you know, what a watch should look like and what a watch should... Like, can you think... I'm thinking of... And, like, um, like I think this... I can't believe, like this stuff to me is so crazy. Like if we're talking about this is like the Jacob and Co. Uh, Dragon Astronomy Tourbillon. So this is a sapphire case. You basically have a sapphire fishbowl around your hand. Yeah, and there's the complete mechanism rotates like a solar system inside this sapphire case. In in theory, these are a million dollars. <laughs> yeah, if if one's ever been made. I mean, if according to uh, their Instagram, it has. I, I'm serious. It's crazy. According to their Instagram, like this is a thing. I'm gonna go back because I'm gonna. I gotta find it um, because there's videos of how these things work. So like, at what, like, what is the next level look like of? Soup. Oh, here we go. Here's an animation, and I can pull this up, I think. I think. Check this out. Play. So we've got a, a tourbillon, and this is, a, I think, a diamond moon. <laughs> yeah. And then there's an earth, uh, and the whole assembly is on an octopus. <laughs> that is, I, that, it's definitely visually stunning. It's so cool. Yeah. I don't want that as a watch. I want that as a, like as a, a table clock. Uh, yeah. Right? I think it that, does. I think it's pretty big, so it probably would work if you just take the strap off. It could be a clock, table clock. Yeah. yeah. So cool. So, like, what is there? Anything else? Anything else on that? Just a, a way over the top, crazy level of watchmaking that that. You know, I think materials are. Materials were the thing 
a few years ago. That was a huge advancement in watchmaking was materials. The silicon stuff. But I think stuff. now they're redesigning. Now that they've they're now that we have a hold of these new materials and are are kind of working through the the problems and discovering new things we can do with these materials. Uh-huh. Now there's new styles of escapements that are popping up uh which are going to totally revolutionize watchmaking. It'll be uh, kind of like when the Swiss lever escapement was invented. What it, there's going to be the, something the new. Name of one or the like, um, Grubel Force uh, that just came out with a uh, a watch that is it, they didn't release a watch, but it's a uh, um like a concept watch, mm-hmm. th- but they built it. Um, that one is probably the latest invention piece. Do we have to? Let's see if I can just Google that and find yeah. out. Is that? Look like something? Yeah. With one of these? Yeah, this one right up here. Is that a good picture of it, I guess? Um it's kind of a weird close up. Is it all is this the same one too? Uh, that's an older one. Okay. Well I'll just it go is, I'll go with yeah. this. All right. So you we can we'll work with this picture here. Yeah. So it's it looks nice, pretty simple from the dial, right? It looks pretty simple. What yeah. am I what are we looking at here? It's it's got a I don't know. How do how do we describe it? So it's got a a dial that's smaller than the case and it's sort of sitting on one of the bridges and lets you see half the movement below sort of like a phantom of the opera mask type of deal yeah right? yeah right? definitely right that's a good description i'm learning yeah. how to describe watches yeah. phantom of the opera dial there yeah <laughs> okay so what what are we looking at with this watch so it's it's showing the escapement over on the left hand side and that's really the most interesting part of this watch the the dial is very simple everything else is kind of from their previous models as well, except for the escapement and the movement, which where, is a, a redesigned... Point with finger and I'll point with the mouse. Right here. This, just this area yeah. over here. Yeah, this area over here, um, that's where they really kind of are changing the architecture of a watch right there. So can you see anything on this escapement that pot jumps out at you as being like, wow, look how blank that is, whatever? Um... You know, I haven't read too much about this escapement, but the long power reserve based on a different... uh, (laughs) It's a different style of escapement. I don't know what they're calling it, Mm -hmm. but uh, you can see the escape wheel teeth are slightly different. Um, You'd probably have to pull up another escape wheel. Uh, To look at it for comparison? Yeah. All right. But there's there's differences in there, and I think it's something that we should definitely talk about in, in... Okay, so we'll do we'll do weird escapements. escapements. Yeah. Okay, cool. Just so that's weird one escapements, and then the here's the other one that I think we can end on because oh, what, that's what, a definitely a good one. What's the, what is the new one called? I'm sorry, uh, it's got a name and I'm blanking on. It. I that just thought about it right piece now. As Here well. it is. Yeah, this is a concept piece, and it's at the uh, what's the name of the the show that's happening right now? Uh, S I H H. I'm not smart enough. S I H H, which yeah. stands for. Uh, Salon International um, Hot Horology. There it is. Okay, cool. Let me find a good picture of this thing. There's a company called Resence. Is it is, is that pronounced correctly? I mean, it sounds um, like it is to me. Yeah, Resence. I guess. Is it Resence? Yeah. All right. Well, this is the best best picture I can find right now of this. Come on, Bobby. Here we go. Look at so this watch is cool looking as hell. I have seen these watches uh, before in stores. You ever seen one of these in person? I have person? not seen one of these in person. Holy shit, yeah. this watch is cool. Okay, so the, it's called a Resonance, I guess. Um, some of them are slightly simpler than this one. This is the new one, and I, I'll have to zoom back out to see the model name. The point of this new one is the the the, the hook. It's, all right, where do we even start with this thing? <laughs> okay, so... There's some really interesting things about this watch. First off, you notice it does not have a crown. This is a mechanical watch that pairs with your smartphone. Okay? Your smartphone, all your smartphone does is send it the correct time. That's it. And then there's a little computer in there that tells it what time to set it at. Everything else is done mechanically, including the movement, which you do have to wind by turning. Uh, 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 there's a uh, an actual handle that sort of pops out of the back, and you spin the whole back. Okay, so now when you look at the front dial, the whole face of the dial spins. So the the main time dial and the two sub dials all spin around on 
in the case together, and then the rings of numbers spin against the needles, which I think always remain straight up. I think. Uh, so <laughs> you've got your minutes over here? Yeah. And this will actually all rotate. So the hands won't always be straight up. Okay, no. I, okay, I said that wrong. Sorry. Yeah. The hands won't always be straight up, but the will the time always be... I can't tell. <laughs> I can't tell if this one, if this rotates that one will within rotate. that, or if the ring rotates. Uh, the ring doesn't rotate. The hand rotates. I think the hand yes, rotates. the hand yeah, rotates. Okay. I believe. Um, not the ring. Let me go back. So that because there's you actually press on the crystal there. Oh, uh, you where do? that hand logo is, uh -huh. and that's what will update your time. Oh, okay. So when there you hit you that uh, the crystal right there, uh huh, it will then sync with your your uh, cell phone. So here's this is a better image because it shows you really the the texture yeah. or lack thereof. It's like a dome. Yeah. So cool looking. And oil then, filled as well, so that it has a really unique kind of uh, look. Very clear when you see through it. Yeah. It, it there's oil in there. Oh really? So you don't and see so the between, airspace between the between the glass, the glass yeah. and oh, I'm sorry between the glass and the and the dial is oil filled. Yeah. To make it look seamless and not yeah. like it almost looks like a, a digital screen kind of yeah because it doesn't it look like a like glass over a yeah. dial oh, that's so cool let's go let me go back because this is what where's what one of their more normal watches this is what their kind of normal watch looks like um, so this one it's a little easier to tell how this the the big the big section moves and then the little section now it's when they don't show a picture with the hands perfectly vertical yeah. it's a little easier to tell how that works yeah. They're, dude, in person, these things are fucking cool. It's tough. They're really expensive. Really expensive. And they have such this cool futuristic look, but like you have no idea. You might just be, you might be throwing your money down the toilet. You have no <laughs> idea. You know what I mean? Do you ever get the money back? You have no idea. But hey, so, if you like it, oh, that's for what sure. Oh, no. Watches are not good investments in general. Yeah. If you want to, to invest, you know, money, um, Wait, what's the name of this of this watch? It's called the Type Two Concept. There we go, mm -hmm. the Type Two Concept. So that's a mechanical watch that that's that has to be uh, the ultimate incarnation of the mechanical watch, right? It's something that stays mechanical, but that yeah. you no longer have to wind or adjust for and, time and zones. And think about it, yeah, time zones. You you could fly around and just tap your uh, tap your watch, and it'll set to the nearest time zone. And I'm I I read that. You don't have to charge this. You never have to charge it. You don't have to plug it in ever. Yeah, I would imagine it's like the uh, the Seiko Spring Drive, where yeah. the winding of the the oscillating mechanism or the the running of yeah. the watch is actually charging a a, uh, a cell yeah. or a capacitor that's in the watch to actually power that when you sync it. Yeah, it, has, kind of it, motor makes enough, it makes yeah. enough juice to operate this little Bluetooth receiver yeah. as well as the motion of the watch. That is extremely cool. I think that's where we can end. That's today. This news is from like a week ago. We started in 1500 BC, <laughs> and in oh an hour and 10 minutes or so, we ended up with a watch that sets itself <laughs> and is also mechanical and is also Bluetooth powered. Yeah. That's about as smart as I want my watches right there. That is the end, right? Would you rock this? Would you rock that oh, watch? Oh, definitely. 100%, yeah. right? Yeah. I would rock that watch 100%. But there's no... And what do you think about, before we just before we wrap this up, have you seen there's these things that are sort of backs to... Like you would, you would stick it behind your watch and it would be, it would be a touch sensor... That goes against your skin, but it kind of hides behind your watch. Okay, and then it it and syncs then with your phone. It, yeah, so it basically turns your you know your your nice mechanical whatever yeah, watch into, into a things. Fitbit. Yeah, which actually I, I would be actually interested in because I I, I like to know that stuff, and it, I would I wouldn't mind having the information, but I don't want to give up my cool watch yeah. for a Fitbit. Yeah, and I definitely don't want to wear a Fitbit on one hand <laughs> and a watch on the other hand like my yeah. dad. What is it with people who sell watches, by the way, that wear two? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, Nicholas G. Hayek was was one of the guys that that did that. And he wore two. It worked for him, I think, because he owned Swatch. Yeah. 
and he you don't wear two blanc pan. You don't wear, did he wear one swatch and one blanc pan? Uh, yeah, he had swatches. He had, I think uh, there's pictures of him with one watch from every brand. I think. I mean, I guess owned. if you're like a pitch man yeah. for, you know, you don't do it. Yeah, you don't do it. I you, don't do it. No, you don't know because your dignity. <laughs> <laughs> you can't once you sell it, you can't get it back. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. All right, I think that's a show, Cameron Weiss. All right. Cameron Weiss, uh, Cameron M Weiss on Instagram. Let's. Well, wait. Is it, oh no, I have to get my plugs back. <laughs> oh, no. oh no, they're gone. I'm sorry. <laughs> Too Our many ins- watches. Oh, there he is. Wait, I found it. Pull Weiss it up. Watch Company. Weiss Watch Company on Instagram. And of course, oh, those are clocks. <laughs> and the smoking tire. Uh, me on Instagram. Thank you to Crown and Caliber for making this show possible. And uh, wow, that's a show. That's a show. The end. <laughs>